Very high tech. That's fair. Very high tech. Yes. Very high tech. Yes. All right. Okay. So as as this goes, and uh, I am thrilled to be here with this guy. He he um, has a very interesting background, but we're going to do it a little different. We're going to try to peel it back a little bit and try to understand who's the guy, what's the journey, and uh, maybe some snippets of learning that he can share. But he's also a man of many dimensions and many interests. And I think you'll be not only psyched to hear from him. But you, don't, you, don't, you don't think I don't know about there, right? <laughs> <laughs> he's not even here. Right in here. Um, so on that note, the man with the big title, and by the way, I think um, he still has big data on his license plate. So you can always find Jerome. So Jerome, how long have you been here in this city? Uh, I've been here for 15 years. 15 years, 15 years. and what kind of accent is that? No, that's the way he talks. <laughs> it's my What's that accent? <laughs> The Jedi accent. Yeah. So. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Chase. Chase, please. Here. Can we talk with Zach? Can you talk me out? We're talking. Maybe talk me out. I don't know. Huh? Oh, hello. Okay. How's my accent? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> how, how about we do it with Zach? This is crazy. <laughs> We're talking with you. I don't know anything about sound. No, you need that. I need this. Don't you think? You need that? Yeah. Yeah. That was great. That was good. That was good. Yeah. We'll be used to it. Eventually. As long as you don't care. Not now. It makes you sound really cool. Yeah. How's my accent? Accent, 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 accent. <laughs> <laughs> good, 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 good. <laughs> we should be good. It's the beer. It's the beer. Okay. All right, it's the beer. So, yeah. Yeah. Hey. Always in beer. <laughs> so Jerome, where are you from? Try to guess. All right, I'm French. Really? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> and you came here 14 years ago. That's right. Okay. Why? I came here to do my civil service, actually my military service. Uh, so in France, that was the last two years I had to uh, do a mandatory military service. But because I had a graduate degree, I could actually do a civil service as doing some research somewhere. And so I found someone at CMU to invite me to do some research instead of crawling in the mud. So that's how I came here. Who would have taken you at CMU? So that was Raoul, uh, with whom I started the company two years after. So. Raoul Badet. That's right, Raoul Badet. Okay, so. You came, you came here, and you didn't know Raoul at all. No, that was a kind of interesting. Uh, that was my first. Uh, actually, my first touch with Pittsburgh was uh, I was in a course, and the professor said, uh, "Oh, I know a professor who's looking for students, and Pittsburgh is not that bad." <laughs> <laughs> I had never heard of Pittsburgh before, and so that's the first thing I heard. And and that was Raoul, and he was to, looking for people to work with him. And I knew I had to do this kind of military service and, or find something abroad and say, hey, I want to go to the States. Actually, at the time, I didn't like the United States. So I say, yeah, I don't like the United States. I want to know why. So let's go there and figure it out now. So. Wait, what's the deal about not liking the United well, States? Well, I know, I'm French and, you know, it's... <laughs> Wait, I'm not getting that. Keep going. Oh, we didn't, I don't know. No, it's just like, you know. <laughs> The French don't like Americans? No, actually, it's not true, actually. The French kind of like it. But I always like, I kind of have a little bit of a negative perception of like imperialism and capitalism over, and not part of it, so it's great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> wow, funny how things change, huh? That's fantastic. That's what you get when you get married, though. That's uh... <laughs> and, and actually, I just want to give a shout out that his wife is right here, and she has been by his side through this whole journey. And uh, we'll we'll peel into that a little bit as well. So she should need a round of applause, actually, because <laughs> we're going to be about her. It's true. And you know, let's just di divert for a second. How many children do you have? Four. <laughs> and what are the age ranges? Uh, one, three, six, nine. So. Okay. One, three, six, nine. 
wanted to point that out as he's been through this journey for the last tw uh, 12 or 14 years. Okay, so you've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think they look like you. Um, okay, so here you are, you're at CMU, and you meet and have a chance to work with Raul Valdez. That's right. And so you're getting ready to finish up your PhD. Yeah, actually, I had not even finished my PhD before coming here, but I knew I didn't want to do math anymore. I did, I did a PhD in math before coming. Total abstract math. Five people in the world write my PhD thesis, so. so I knew I wanted to do something that had a little more impact and decided to switch field a little bit, so. So at that point, you were how old, 20? Uh, no, a little more older, like 23. 23, already finished. And you graduated um, high school in France a little early, right? That's right. It's not very early. Though, so. <laughs> <laughs> Are you questioning the no, interviewer? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you graduated early, and you decide you know, that you're going to come here, you're in the civil service, you come here, you meet Raul. What else did you do along the way? So what kinds of things? You came here, you're in Pittsburgh, you didn't know anything. Know, the, the funny story is that when I, you know, when I, when I, came, when I came here, uh, in the plane actually, I had a little notebook and I said, okay, here are all the things I want to accomplish during my 16 months here. One of them was to date an American girl. Uh, another one was to run a marathon and the third one was to start a business. And so uh, I don't remember all the things I didn't do, but I ended up marrying an American woman and, and having four kids and I ended up running one marathon and almost died at the end. But, uh, and I did start a business and, and, and that was the, the whole story. So. so do you have any more things on that checklist that you can remember? Well, I don't remember. You know, I only remember the thing I did. You know, I had many others that I didn't, didn't, uh, didn't succeed with. So. Okay, so you finish your PhD and you and Raul all of a sudden think of the idea of this company? No, that was interesting. So I came in and I had this idea in the back of my mind. I actually took some, uh, it was interesting, before all invited me, I mean, he was in the academia and we were, uh, you know, doing some fundamental research. And I said, hey, I want to take some MBA courses. And he's like, what is this guy up to? You know, he had really no idea why I wanted to do that. But, you know, he, he came along with it. And then, uh, and then, you know, as we did some research, we found that the, you know, it started to look more and more like a product. One of the PhD students who became one of the third co founder made our stuff like a hundred times faster and at that point I'm like, hey, that looks like a product. I'm sure some people will buy this thing. And so I kind of nudged Raul and said, why don't we start a business? And I think he was ready for it. I mean, I think he wanted to change. He wanted to do something that was more change from academia and he, he went along with it. So we started in uh, June 2000. So it's the two of you. You had a lot of cash in your pocket at the time to start this company? Yeah, a lot of cash. You know, like, uh, so we actually you know, went to friends and family to put like uh, 70k uh, to start it, so just you know, start with that, with our money or and friends and family. That's how we started. And then, did you raise any money? So it was an interesting time. Right? So it was uh, June 2000. Uh, so imagine with the the, the, the dot com uh, boom, and at the time there was, there was no hope to get any money. If you remember, it was an interesting time. It was like it was just the time where people were like, "Oh, B two C is dead, is dead." So let's do B two B, which lasted like nine months, and after people realized B two B is as much bullshit as B. See? <laughs> uh, and really everything went down from there. But the really interesting thing is that actually one reason we started the company is that we submitted, mm -hmm. so the technology we started with was something called dark and cross I'm not going to go into detail, but we actually submitted a, a, a research a, a proposal for a research grant to the NSF. Mm -hmm. And despite Raoul's very good skill in submitting proposal, it was rejected. So we felt kind of a re Kind of reject. And then we went to CCMU and said, hey, we have this great technology, do you want to do something with it? And say, ah, eh, no, it's not interesting. So, like, man. And so we actually decided to start a business with it, which was very interesting. I'll talk about it later when you're on CMU and how it worked with them. But, and um, we actually submitted a, a research, uh, an SBIR, which, if you're an entrepreneur is in, in doing something on novel, is the best thing under the sun, to the NSF. The same NSF that rejected us, and we got it. And so at the time you get the first round is you get $100,000, and it's free money, absolutely free money. And if you do a good job with the first $100,000, you get a second round, which is $700,000. And that was really the lifesaver, because at the time we got the second round, it's when uh, September 11th hits, which was really a nuclear winter for business. I mean, really for a year you couldn't get, it. nobody would talk to you again. But we got that grant. And so at the time that allowed us for a year to just develop the product, and really that, that 
that's what launch does. And then we even get the third. You get the third one, which is phase two B, right. uh, and we get actually we are very really creative there because you need matching funding, right. usually from a customer, and we use innovation works <laughs> as a matching funding. So we didn't really have a matching customer. Okay, no one's recording that, are they? <laughs> no, that's okay. It was perfectly legal. I didn't know about it. Don't worry about it. So it worked out well. And so we were perfectly legal. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, we wouldn't do it. You know, that's why I can't talk about it. There are things I can't talk about, but this I can. <laughs> so we got a million and a half dollars, you know, just like that, which is no institutional investor at that point. And the NSF is money is completely free. Uh, I mean, we should have a kind of a duty to the taxpayer. That's the way you know, Raul always puts it. You know, thank you, that taxpayer, who funded us. So, so, but we get back to you because we paid some taxes over the years. So, uh, so did you hire a bunch of people then? Yeah, at that point we managed to hire and grow the team. Yeah, and actually get an office at that point, which was a small house on, uh, next to Beachwood. So that was that was a great time. I mean, well, it was a tough time with September 11th, etc. But then we managed to grow and go through it thanks to that. So, but what did you know about any of the guidelines of an SBIR? There's a lot of that, criteria. And I compliance. think what helped us there, I mean, is that uh, Raul having. So we had a little bit of a, an advantage. Is Raul having been in the academia world knew how to write a good proposal, and it, there's an art to it. I mean, I don't know it. I didn't write it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we hired our first employee, Danny Brzezinski, and he was very good at that as well. Was hired to do this, and you have to write them properly, and then it's not so hard, you know, to, to, to get it. But, but then you have to comply with it. There's yeah, a lot there, of there is some compliance. They're not too too difficult. I mean, you need to do enough to get the second phase, and you need to prove some things for the second phase. But we did a good job at it, and we were very focused, and we, we got it. So I was I was that's definitely. I mean, we wouldn't be I wouldn't be here uh, without it. It was a great uh, great way to start. I mean, when you get a million bucks free money. And, so yeah, then it, you never took any venture money? So until like 2008, and I can go through this, where we took a little bit of venture money, we didn't take any, didn't take any money for you know, a very long time. We just bootstrap the company from there. Uh, and you know, they, at that point, we tried to get customers very, very early. So we didn't try to raise anything. We are not distracted. And we just got customers to pay for the, the growth of the company. You know? and, and little by little, we had one employee, then two employees, then three, four employees, then eight employees. Amazingly, even if it's high growth, it still takes some time to, to go to you know, uh, 120 employees, which we were at the time. So were there any employees that started back then and were part of uh, the exit that still were working for the company? Uh, well, that's a good, well, any employees, you know, uh, I think number two or number three was still there. Obviously, <laughs> our three founders were still there at the moment of acquisition, so. Okay, okay. So, so you get the Sibber, and then you never do you take money from Innovation Works? You take money from so we got we got money from Innovation Works, right? You know, which was a loan at that point. So it was okay, just a, and that was in that same period of time. Loan. Yeah, just at the beginning. So that's how we started the company. And never any interest in taking venture money. Well, uh, we looked a little bit into it, and uh, but interestingly, actually, at some point we were looking into it, and we got a huge deal from AOL, and uh, that actually they were kind of a second founder, and just. A major multi-million dollar deal with them, and you know that's why we went to our new office, and that that was great, you know, that was that was better than DC money. So. so you know, many of the stories that we hear, even locally, is that people are chasing money. There's not enough capital. There's not enough seed. There's not enough investment. So interestingly, anyway, we never did this because you know there was no opportunity to get money at that time. So that actually allowed us to focus. It takes a lot of time to go after money, so that allowed us to focus on the product and grow it. But as I say, it's not like we. Didn't have any money. We did get the NSF grant, uh, but after that, we really focused on growing the customer base. Uh, where is focus? But now, as I mentioned to you, actually, not getting money is a weird thing. It, 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 it's actually great that you get acquired, obviously, it's great for me. Um, but it, it makes you a bit of an outlier in, in the community. And there's some part. I mean, you always think that it would be better for everybody, but it made actually almost hiring a little bit. <laughs> Harder because you didn't have kind of outside validation, and also it was kind of like the Raul and Jerome show. So you know we owned the company, we could do whatever we want, and people felt out. You know what kind of you know other check do you have? Do you have someone above your shoulder? And we didn't have that. There was no one, right? That's right. It, you know you could do whatever you want. That's right. Which is which is you know it's good for you, but actually for other people. Not necessarily give them the confidence. And so, how did you get people to believe in you? Uh, well, good convincing. I mean, the other thing, 
So we thought the best part of it is that when you don't get VC money, then there's no preferred shares. So we never have preferred shares. You know, in the whole history of the company, never had any preferred shares. And so that's where you say we say, hey, if we get acquired even for, you know, not much, even for like one X revenue, you'll still make a good amount of money. But it's not enough actually. This is from a guy who was thought of Americans as capital. <laughs> <laughs> Just one of them. Just saying. Oh, you can give me a hard time about that. No problem. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, well, you know, money is a good validation too in some ways. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we thought actually it was a part of it. So because you don't have the preferred shares, you know, the, sh- the options are worth something. But it's interesting. All I don't know if that's changed now, but if you take from five years ago to like a year ago. I would say, you know, the options, the options story kind of lost a lot of luster, you know, for a long time actually, you know. So you could say that people would say, oh, "Hey, yeah, I heard that story before," you know, I want a salary, I don't want options, you know. That's uh, even though in our case we felt, hey, it, it is really one. Even if, even if we really do bad, you know, we'll get something out of it. But anyway. Well, so the the piece of uh, you know, ten years, lots of things happen. I mean, I remember something called Clusty. Well, we tried a, a few things. So, uh, you know, and uh, you know, we tried to be in the consumer business for a while. You know, actually, when we started, we put a site uh, out there. We was doing like organizing search results on top of Google and Yahoo and other search engines, and we got a lot of traction. We went to you know a few hundred thousand queries a day, which you know, compared to Google, it doesn't sound like anything. But you have to get there. It's not. So we got a lot of traction, but then. With Google's competition, you know, you, you can't compete, compete against Google head on. So, but thankfully, we kind of put only five percent of the effort on this, and ninety-five percent on the corporate side of things. You know, trying to do B two B, and that's where most of the growth and the, the effort went. So, what happened to Cluster? We sold it actually to a crazy guy. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is the best story. Where I can say that one. Well, you, you can I'll, share that. I can share that one. Well, okay, yeah. so. So because I have a T-shirt that says oh, this, the T-shirts were the best. Okay, the name first is a weird thing. Yeah, but where does Clusty come from? Clusty? That's, actually, that's my first license plate. The same was big deal. My first license plate is Clusty. Actually. Is it? Okay. I, I, I so the, cluster? Yeah, I, mean, that's okay. how, I came up with the name. So I was kind of interesting. I came up with the name, and uh, and Raul hated it, and a lot of people hated it, and then somewhat Raul started liking it. And then after he started to be the biggest proponent of it, even me, I was like, ah, oh, man, this sounds cheesy, this sounds like Crusty the Clown. <laughs> you know, like people were telling me, oh, it's Crusty the Clown from, and I don't have TV, so I don't know, like, uh, what is it? It's the, uh, the Simpson, I think, right? <laughs> but, you know, we never managed to. to, uh, to but you sold it. Big money. I'm sorry? You sold it. So at some point, because we knew we got a, you know, a new management team and they said, you've got to focus, what do we do with this thing? And we were just about to close it, just to put the kill the door. And then the guy comes to us and say, hey, I want to buy it. And we're like, OK. It's, like, it's, not, it's five million bucks. Buy back plastic. It's five million bucks. And like, OK. But you know, he didn't give us five million bucks because he didn't have the money. But we made like, you know, almost like a million bucks on this thing, which we wanted to just stop. And we sold it to him. It's still around. I think it's called Yippee now. It's called what? Yippee. <laughs> Okay. Look at the guy. It's kind of really good crazy. names here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, you, may, you have Did you have any other products that you sold during this no. period of time? I'm telling you, the joke in town is that I'm the best and the worst guy at naming things. Okay, in the company, like okay. I name some part of the product, and people always say, "Jerome, you're not involved in naming anything <laughs> anymore." I'm French, though. I don't <laughs> <laughs> name speakers, <laughs> so, you know, what's it like? To start a company and have these employees, and I mean, were you a masterful leader at that point? I mean, at, at the beginning, it's a lot of fun. Um, I think, especially, especially for Raul coming from academia, you know, when you're in academia, and I was also a bit of academia. It's a lot of like, you know, you like your stuff, and you have someone next to you. All the other faculties do other things, and everybody kind of. Is a little bit passive aggressive about criticizing what everybody else is doing. There's a little bit of competition, you know, and you're not you're not working as a team. And when you work in a company, especially early on, what was amazing for us is this sense of like you have 50 people in the company, and everybody has the same goal, which is, is to sell, to grow, to make a great product. When you become a little bigger, and when you reach the 100 or 100, then you start to get a little bit of politics, though. Nothing like IBM, obviously, and, and I think we, we always manage it. 
We can't like talk that. about that. No, I can't say I have young song parties. It's not going to surprise anybody. So, but uh, that's a great feeling actually to start and to feel like everybody's aligned behind a, a goal. It's one of the best feelings of starting a company. And I think for Raul, it was a great feeling for him coming from a kind of a different environment. No, the bad side of yeah, starting yeah. a company is you have to do with a lot of crap, and that's which when you are, you know, an academic, you, a lot of things. Well, you still have to write grants and stuff, but you're a little more, you know, a little more. What's your greatest crap um, memory? <laughs> My greatest crap memory. Oh, I have so many. I can't even tell you. All right, well, uh, pick one that you think. You know, the, the, the hardest things are people quitting. That is, you know, uh, because of inter and in our case, people have quit because of interpersonal problems. You know, they just couldn't get along with each other. And I, I was never, I don't believe that I was ne ever the reason why they quit. But they quit because of other, and, and that's really hard to deal with. You know, that, that what do you mean, they quit? Because, because they don't get along with someone else, you know. And so that's really But not you. Not me, you know. Okay. But I, I'm, I'm in the middle and trying to make sure it, it, you know, it sticks around. And, and, and the funny thing for a while, every time I will go in vacation abroad, something bad will happen. <laughs> Someone will quit, someone will there, and I will have to deal with it when I'm on the phone. That, that is the most painful memory, you know, people quitting in this event. What did to... you do? What's your strategy? Did you ever try to save someone that yeah, you shouldn't very, have saved? Yeah, the problem is you have to save them before. Once they've made up their mind, it's very... I've tried, believe me, I've tried, okay. I went to but you just home, throw many, money at them? Throw money at them, I've tried, I, 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 I went to their home, I've done my best comments thing, and uh, it doesn't work. So once you lose them, you, know, you, don't, wanna, you don't wanna go to that point. So, people, you know, yeah. so that's one. The other, you know, biggest crap is just customers. You have to deal with them. And as I told you before, I, 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 I mean, one part of being an owner is you care about everything. And you care about the customer. And if they have the problems, they're not happy, uh, you care a lot. At some point, we had a partner, and we were selling a lot to law firms. And law firms are just the worst, worst customer ever. What are any lawyers in there? Oh, I can't understand. I've talked to law firms, and there's a simple reason. Law firms are a limited partnership, which means that every dollar they make is shared between the partners. Right. So every dollar they spend, it's out of their pocket. Right. That's right. And so they put huge pressure on all their employees that they can't spend a dollar if they really. So when you sell some stuff to them, if something doesn't work, man, they give you an earful, and they make really, really, really give you a hard time. So you say, stop selling to law firms. No. <laughs> That was not so is that a big part of your market? Well, that's an interesting story on its own. If you want to jump around, we we, we uh, had a great partnership with Interwoven, uh, who was selling to law firms. They introduced us to that market, and at some point, the partnership is another story. They are very hard to establish, and this was actually a most successful partnership. After a year and a half of struggling, we got them running, and they were just selling like size bread. And we were selling, and we, were selling, and we sold like 30 customers in a year, which in non-price business is, is odd. We were poised to just grow this thing and just dominate the market. And our competitor bought them, uh, Autonomy. Uh, you know, have you heard of Autonomy? They were bought by HP. And so they bought us, took them out, of, which was a really shrewd step, because I think we were about to really make a, a dent there. But the great thing about it is that I didn't have to deal with lawyers after that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best thing ever. So from the day until we bought them, every, we stopped completing the legal business. So. so when, you know, you moved into Squirrel Hill and you moved that space, there was a lot we were, of... We were always in Squirrel Hill, actually. Right. Our own basement was in Squirrel Hill. Our first house was in Squirrel Hill next to uh, Beachwood. And then we found a space on Forbes and Murray, which is very similar to here, actually just in front of the church like this. And, and so, I mean, you really sort of rocked the neighborhood, you know, coming in there and taking over. You, you know, you Actually, built... I, 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 I'm not just us, we had the acquisition building, you know. We had three companies in that building, we were in Forbes and Murray, about the right end. You had uh, Collaborative Fusion, you had uh, M Model, and you had after that building, all companies got acquired, so. So you're staying But there's no lot. more space there, so don't worry, we're trying to get <laughs> Is there no more space in that building? No, actually, they're never trying. They're gonna actually maybe build a couple of more floors. But, uh, Are you trying to expand in that building? You will try, but I think your model is trying to try harder. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, so, so what's it like? What was it like to build your company in Squirrel Hill? No, uh, that's a great thing. I mean, you know, one aspect of the attractiveness of the first we could build our space, and we made the space very kind of unconventional. Like a lot of space we looked at downtown, for example, and it was actually cheaper downtown, and they had all the offices, I and mean, I remember visiting an office, and you enter, and it looked beautiful, and you had like a view on the stadium, and you had a huge conference room, and they say, okay, this is a CEO's office, so he's here only 10% of the time, 
and these are two conference rooms, and we're like, okay, so where does the people work? And you will open a little door, and that's where all the ants were, because it was all the cubicles, and they had no view, nothing, no lights, and all the great part were given to, and we're like, okay, that's not what we want. We want the, kind of the opposite. So we create an office where all the windows are on the outside of the scene, all the, all the cubic, no cubicles, but up an office on the outside when you get the light, and if you want an office, you're on the inside with a window inside the office. So that was kind of a way to do it. And I don't, I don't have an office. I, I have a nice view, though. Like, you don't have an office? No, I don't have an office. No. Where do you sit? I sit in the middle of the developers. And, uh, and I have Even bit, now with IBM? Yeah, that's right, yeah. It's a bit, sometimes it's tricky because I'm a lot on the phone, but it's, it's OK. I like it better, I guess. So if you need so. to have work done, you just sort of set up where you need sometimes to Sometimes we have this, you know, you can, I, I go, if I really have a long call, I go somewhere else. But. But you asked me about Square Isle, so one really nice thing is to get people to walk to the office. So, I mean, I, I bet you that made a huge difference in hiring a lot of people, the fact that uh, actually we had an office that they could walk to or live in the neighborhood that they liked uh, rather than having to commute to the, the suburbs. So that was actually a great thing. Were you able to attract a lot of people from Carnegie Mellon? CMU is a, you know, a tricky, I think we have lots, you know, we have you know, at least more than a dozen uh, people who come from, uh, from CMU, more than that, you should, uh, but uh, I think not enough in some way. You know, I feel like at this point, uh, what we found out a long time recently that the, the best companies, like you know, the Google and the Facebook of the world, have the entries into CMU that we don't have, even though we are a CMU company. No, you lost it when you left after you did that cyber. I'm sorry? When you did that SBIR. Yeah, well, actually, CMU was interesting. As, as I mentioned, I will talk about it, is that uh, we were actually the first people to uh, do something with the technology they released to us. So there were actually really no legal ground for this. So CMU had very good terms, especially when they released it to you. But they really, nobody knew what these terms meant, because every time they released something to someone, they never did anything with it. So you. Didn't you owe money back to CMU when you had your exit? Because it, because it didn't mean anything. And, you know, we negotiated 10 years after starting the company, and it, they didn't. I mean, they made some money, but but quite not not a significant amount actually. Wow, shame on that. So, well, I mean, they were, it was good for us. But, that was good for you, right? Uh, but yeah, they were they were never very involved. That's the pity. I think CMU is the best. And now that you know, as you know, I'm doing this, you know, trying to promote Pittsburgh as a big data right. uh, place. CMU is definitely the the, the biggest asset in Pittsburgh, there's no question. I mean, you, you talk to people in California, and you know that, right. and oh, yeah. they know about CMU. So we gotta, we got to get CMU to basically, you know, uh, how can I say that? I think not enough people from CMU stay there after they graduate. And there should be more impact of CMU on, on to Pittsburgh uh, from a business standpoint. So, you know, I want to fast forward a little bit because you and Raul, and then Chris, were co-founders, and Raul was the CEO. Mm -hmm. But a few years ago, that all changed. That's right, yeah. So we hired a new, a new team. Uh, we hired a new CEO. Did, it, did you sit around and say, we can't take this company to the next level? Um, uh, officially, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? It means it's always more complicated than the official story. Uh, it, it, it was not so painful, and I, I, I don't think Raul, and Raul was pretty uh, graceful in the way it happened, etc. But it was not a not necessarily an easy process. So. And so, did you have anyone in mind to run the company? Actually, we, yes, like we did have in mind someone in mind, which was the CEO we ended up hiring. But at first, he said no. Who uh, he was actually uh, part of our board at the time. So we wanted to hire him, and he said no, and so we went on the search, which was pretty painful. Uh, Why was it painful? Actually, for one of the reasons I mentioned, is people were scared by the company, by the way it was structured. Because you didn't have, because you guys were the owners? Money. Because we were the owners. They felt like, oh, well, I'm going to have to look over my shoulder, and you guys right. have thing. How to do these, I Two loose cannons. That's right. So, which you know, I retrospectively didn't understand. At the time, I couldn't understand it. It just baffled me. I'm like, look, I can give you a, sh a good share in a company that is worth something. But any way you put it, it will be worth your money, you know, your, uh, your time. And yeah, people were kind of scared by it. So, and we got, you know, one of the most painful <coughs> time in the company. We got an aborted hiring. So we announced the CEO to the company, and the guy just, you know, uh, decided decided not to take the position after we announced it to everybody. That was like, 
That was the worst time ever. So. And what happened? <laughs> then I actually became temporary CEO, uh, so that you know we showed the employee that we will be serious about it, and then we kind of convinced our board member to become actually our CEO. Uh, so did you lose staff during that time? No, I actually just you know I was my. Uh, one of the things I feel in the progress is that as I was temporary CEO, I managed to kind of keep the ship going and and uh, make sure nobody was leaving, so nobody left during that period, so even though it was very a lot of uncertainty actually uh, for the company. Okay, so you know you have this this exit recently. How long has it been? Nine months. Nine months. So you've been an employee of IBM for nine months. That's right. Yeah. So. You, part of the um, acquisition was that you would become an employee of IBM? Uh, informally, so IBM does things uh, very cleanly. So because I'm a big, I was a big shareholder, they didn't try to put anything on me, like, you know, that your shares are not worth the same thing other. So they don't really, they, I, don't, I don't have a retainer, I don't have anything. But they did ask me, you know, are you going to stick around? And I said, yes, okay. Uh, That's it's just, it. Just a gentleman <laughs> agreement, yeah. That's all they did. You didn't sign anything. No, I didn't sign anything. No. So were you being honest? Well, I've been around right now. <laughs> You've been around for but nine months, Jerome. Nine months, yeah. No, I, okay. I didn't say I would stick around forever. I mean, what I told them is you have to make it interesting to me for me for me to stay. Um, so do they call you every week and say, are you still... I told them, you better give me a, a, chief, a big data chief t title, you know? Oh, uh, so uh, that's why you <laughs> have to that title. Okay. Okay, so the, now that you have title, do you have clout with these 300,000 people of IBM? 430,000. Oh, excuse me. 430,000 people. One of the largest co uh, you know, company by employee in, uh, in the okay. world. Okay, so you have a lot of friends there. Uh, I've spent my life nice months talking to new people almost every day. Yeah, so. So why are you still there? Well, I want to make you know. One thing is, I want my you know, I want them to get their money worth. I mean, I feel like you know, some kind of moral obligation. That sounds stupid, but you know, uh, I do uh, to a certain point. You know, I'm not going to stay there ten years for that. But uh, and I, you know, I want to make the integration work. You know, it's you know, it's my baby. I want it, I want it to flourish in there. So. But Raul decided not to go to IBM. Well, there was reason. And Raul had the, when he was replaced as CEO, he said he had less of an operational role, so it didn't make sense for him to stay. Uh, okay. But I had you know I had. You can handle a lot of things. Yeah. And the funny thing is that all the new team is gone now, so I'm actually now you know back to being the more senior and that. So know. how many people from Vivisimo actually went? What percentage? Went to IBM. Everybody that wanted to stay stayed, basically. How? How? What percentage was that? Ninety-five percent. Really? Yeah. And so. And um, so, how's the IBM culture? I thought you said we wouldn't talk about IBM. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I can talk about it. It's actually interesting. I mean, uh, IBM is a great company as an uh, as an acquirer. I think they do a fantastic job. Their integration team is very good. They acquire business to grow it. If you, I mean, it's not bullshit. You can hear what their CEO said. They basically take businesses and they say, can I grow that business bigger for what they do? Which is a great thing because they keep everybody. They want to keep everybody. They continue what they do. They don't piss off your customers. They try to do everything right. So from an acquisition standpoint, everything right. Okay, And they're very good in, uh, at that. Um, but it's a big company. And they have their own, you know, what's difficult to understand is that big companies have you know, directive coming from the top, you know, sometimes like hiring, you know. If your whole division, which is, you know, 50 times bigger than you, has a block on hiring, then you can't hire anymore. Or, not that it happens to us, but it's just, so it, it's, you're part of a bigger strategy, which is difficult. And then it's a very matrix organization, so it's very chaotic in some way. Everybody gets involved in, in everything, and you get business, you get, you don't get a, a meeting without 30 people, which, it, it culturally, it, that's tough, you know. I like, when I look at it, I'm like, man, you guys, you know, I was the owner of my company, so when I saw a meeting where someone shouldn't be there, you know, I'm like, why are you here? You just right. go do something else, you know. But then they have 30 people in the room and only one person is talking. <laughs> I'm like, 29 people are paid to be in that meeting for nothing. You know, that's the way I look at it. But, uh, so it, but it's the nature of it. It's very inefficient, you know, and big company is very inefficient. And I mean, I don't, I don't know how to do it better than them. I mean, they are very successful right now. Uh, I think there are lots of things they do very, they do right, you know. They, they, you know, they take the right amount of risk. You know, they 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 do business to to last. And when you compare them to HP, you know, HP takes these stupid big big bets. 
you know, right. and then they don't pan out, and you take big risks, you know, people, your stock goes down. I mean, IBM just takes smaller risks, but they take risks. But they take smaller you sound risks. like a company man already. That's right, I, I've been whitewashed, you see? <laughs> no, I think true. you really drank their Kool-Aid. No, no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't drink the Kool-Aid. So, and one thing, I mean, I think IBM wants to transform. So one thing I'm trying to see right now is can we transform that culture for the better? And honestly, if I can, I'll stay. If I can't, I'll leave. That's the way I look at it. And I have, I've been very vocal about what needs to be changed, so we'll see. Uh, I mean, one problem at IBM is hard to get authority to do certain things. And we are in a new field, we're in this big data field, and I feel like, hey, if we want to succeed, we have to run this more like a startup, and you've got to give some authority to a few people to run this. And so that's, you know, that's what I'm telling them right now, so we'll see what happens. So you could leave at any time? I can leave at any time, yes, that's right. So, okay. so um, what's next for you? Wow, okay, I have uh, a few plans. Uh, well, number one plan is to make the acquisition successful. I mean, I'm an employee at IBM and I want to make that work. But I say, I'll see if it works, I'll tell them what, to do, what I think should be done, and I'll see if they listen. I think they actually tend to listen, but you know, I'm going to tell them things that it's going to be hard for them to, well, I'm telling them things that I think would be hard for them to change, but we'll see. So that's one thing. Another thing, I'm going to do some self-promotion here, is that you know, I'm launching an initiative in Pittsburgh to try to put some, Oh, he's doing, and an I'm, I'm he's doing an ad right now. I'm doing an ad, but you know, you know, you were part of this. I told you, you know, one thing I wanted to do is, is after an acquisition, is say, hey, you know, how do you give back to Pittsburgh? And uh, and I looked at it, and I had some ideas about, you know, making Pittsburgh a better party town. And, okay, you know. Let, let's share. This is how Jerome. No, no, please say, don't. No, say. I just want to share this. This is Jerome's idea. Raul, who I knew and still know very well, much more than I knew Jerome said, I really want you to get to know Jerome. I really want him to get involved in the community. He needs to get networked and know more people. He's been heads down for the last 14 years, and he's got some ideas and some ways to give back. OK, I'm handing it to you. What was the idea? No, no. OK, I'm not going to talk about the first idea. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good idea. It was supposed to do OK, two, what's two, the two, idea? It was to make Pittsburgh more attractive to young people. To By doing here. what? What were we going to do? Some interesting parties, you know? <laughs> That you know, if, if uh, you know, we sh so the other idea was to <laughs> make Pittsburgh known for other things than just the Steelers and the Pirates, right? And and Ed's and Ned, you know. So how do you put like a new label? I think it's hard for Pittsburgh to compete, you know, as as an entrepreneurship destination overall. You know, it's hard to compete against uh, like in Silicon Valley or or even you know or New York or Boston. You know, I don't know if you saw the last report from Forbes, we're number 13, which is not bad. But you know, 88 million venture investment against 1.5 for Boston and 4 billion for for big data. It was the buzz around big data, around all this kind of you know, data is a new oil. Why try to put a label in in, uh, in Pittsburgh? So that's why I've been working for a couple of months and get out of my cave. I met with actually you know, lots of people and everybody was very supportive. So we have this event tomorrow uh, uh, at uh, the University Club. Tomorrow night. At from six to eight, and actually we have right now almost 250 registration. We'll have 22 uh, startups or research exhibits. projects, exhibits, yeah, right. of big data. And we put that together in, like three, uh, months, in two months. three months. But they, actually, we asked for the exhibits two weeks ago, and we got like 22 submissions in a record time. So amazingly, what we found is there's lots of stuff around data and big data in Pittsburgh that nobody knows about. And that's what we were planning to do, is just to make it aware. So you know, if we could put a new label and say, and, and CMU, as you can imagine, and Pete as well, are actually doing amazing things around big data. I mean, Randy Bryan, who is the, uh, the dean of uh, uh, the School of Computer Science at CMU, is actually on the board of, it's called Pittsburgh Data Works. Uh, PGHDataWorks.org, you can register for the event tomorrow. <laughs> you see I'm the sales guy. You know? I, know. I like that. <laughs> so Randy Bryan and I accepted to build the board immediately, and, and lots of people. We have you know, the, the dean of the Heinz School, we have vice provost for research at <laughs> Pitt, uh, we have someone from NetApp, from uh, Management Science Associates, we have you on the board, and so that was lots of, that was actually really refreshing. I, I, I didn't imagine I would get that. So I think Pittsburgh has lots of assets, and I hope you know, we can put it on the map and get some traction. I think we had a good idea on the party. Yeah. Maybe we'll do some parties here. Yeah, but we were trying to create sort of a mystique around doing some party that occurred 
without letting everyone know that there was going to be a party. It featured the Pittsburgh Star next year, right? Remember? Right. We have some good ideas we plan to levitate that at some Actually, point. That's a good model for a business. When you start something, you have no idea where it's going to go. Okay. And usually it ends up where you didn't think where it started. And like, it's, it's pretty, that's the same thing. Same thing with a business. So there's, there's another thing about him is that when we talked about parties, he said, you know, I really like to dance. <laughs> <laughs> what does that to do with starting a startup? And like a, I don't know. I don't know what it had to do with anything at the time when we talked about it. You like the personal stuff, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, how are we doing on time? Hey, Paul. We're good. We're good. I mean, about five minutes. Should we get people to query? Yeah. Yes, he wants to, he wants to um, engage the audience a little bit. Engage away. Engage away. We have two mics. Should we get them away? Or? Okay. Questions? Anybody have any questions? This is your chance. He goes back wow. to big job right. tomorrow. Question. Right. Big um, job tomorrow. Do you have any anticipation that you might just, you know, of course, just leave everything at IBM and just go back into this crazy startup life that we're all in? That's a good question. So you can ask my wife, like, for years after I told her, if I ever talk about starting something new, just shoot me, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. I mean, I have said that so many times you can imagine. Now, if you ask me, I think I'll start something new at some point. Yes, but so you don't have to shoot me, so I'll be there in a few years. <laughs> you know, I asked him that, and I said, I can't see you just being at IBM, and you know, I think you're just going to wake up one day and just go, they're integrated, they're done, I'm out of here, what's next? Sure, you'll travel around the world and do some interesting things, but. Yeah. Starting but I'll tell you, I have some theory. I think I think we're brainwashed. I mean, like our brains tricks us in believing that we need to do this thing because, I mean, I don't know. It's painful to start something and, and seeing through. It's just like you know all the pain of like dealing with customers, with employees, with you know worrying about the company's not going to be there tomorrow. It's, when you're in it, you're like, there's no reason to do this thing. But then after you forget about it completely, you're like, hey, you know that sounds good. You know, <laughs> I want to do my own thing again. You know. <laughs> I think we're just idiots. <laughs> so if you had to do it again 14 years later, uh, what do you think of the climate here now? Uh, you talked about 14 years ago there really wasn't anything but FBIRs. So where are we now? Like, are, are we in a better spot? Uh, in Pittsburgh, I, I, I think so. I mean, I, actually, I'm pretty amazed by the number of you know uh, uh, activities and incubators. So it definitely is, is a much, much more vibrant scene uh, now than it was before. I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a v, I'm not a good VC expert, so I don't know how much funding you get here. I, I still believe it's not that easy to get kind of second round beyond seed. Okay. Even, uh, even seed is hard. Yeah. So that's that's a pity. But, uh, when you guys talk about big data, when you pulled information for uh, Vivisimo, did you ever work with any government entities? And if so, how did you? Form those kind of partnerships. Yeah, government is uh, is kind of the best and the worst. So we got lots of. I mean, our best deal at some point was <coughs> we said go. I remember when we got that deal, I thought you know that's it. I, I made it, which was not true actually. But um, so government can, and especially you know, I, I don't know about today because you know it's <coughs> but you know it's Bush in power. It was great uh, to do some deals with government, but it's it's very flaky. I and mean, in some way, like we got the best out of it and the worst out of it. And and I still don't know how. All I know, actually, so we got some big deals with the government. Um, and then we thought, then once we get this deal, we should get more. But we did a bad hire at that point, and we, we hired a guy who hired, hired bad people and bad salespeople, and we kind of lost all of government business in a couple of years. And now we're rebuilding it. And I don't know if it's due to the bad hire. I don't know if it's due to uh, the fact that you know there was some you know problem in the government. So it's it's, you know, I understand why I win and lose uh, corporate business, you know, because we did a good job, we did a bad job. I don't get any, I, I don't understand the government business. I don't understand how it works. Also, I'm a foreigner, so I'm telling you, I have to meet them, like, you know, on the picnic table at, outside of their building to be able to talk to them. But. In, terms of, in terms of data, though, was a lot of data public record that you were working with? or? Yeah, but the public is not. So the yeah you know, the big money at some point was with all the you know the security data okay you're talking about big 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 data okay and we're still working with them and we're still hoping to get some big data some really fascinating I mean sometimes spooky but you know uh, project there 
public is something actually we get there, but it's you know there's less money. Though actually with the Obama administration maybe shifting a little bit. So we we tried to partner with Data to Go for example for a long time and never managed to get something on the ground. Sorry. Oh no, that's okay. Huh? I was wondering when you were getting started in the beginning, did you just sort of have a natural understanding of business strategy, or you had a background in that, or did you have an advisor? <laughs> So, no, I mean, obviously, well, actually, Raul, my uh, co-founder, was good at trying to get advisors. So the problem when you get business advice is that you, well, he has always this saying that you always get an advice and it's contrary, okay? So, if you ask a few times, actually, he just wrote a book, I do some promotion also, for like, uh, 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 advice is for winners. So, he actually wrote a book on how to collect advice. And the other day, I felt like, you know, the advice we got, I never thought was, uh, was that, Great, and we were not that business savvy. Uh, so, for example, to give you an idea of how bad we were, we we're like, uh, how do you need, why do you need a budget? Yeah. Okay, why do you need a budget? And the people were coming to us like, oh, you know, I, I, I manage sales now, I need a budget. They're like, why do you need a budget? You know, that really made them mad. I can tell you that. So, uh, and it was a little bit of Raoul's personality. You know, he had to be convinced of everything. So that that, that drove people a little crazy. So, in terms of I think in terms of uh, advice, the best business advice I've had, which actually came from the new team that came on board, which we they didn't necessarily manage to implement either, is to just focus. Uh, now, when you start a company, you can't really focus because you have to be opportunistic. But if you want to grow, you have to focus. And it's funny because now that I'm with an IBM, it's the one business advice I have for them. Because they think they are IBM, they don't need to focus, it's completely wrong. Even when you're IBM, you need to focus. You need to have a focus story, you need to tell the same story to everybody, you need to do one thing and do it well to the people you serve. So uh, I wish I had, I had understood that, that focus before. I think our, the company would have been worth 10 times worse if we had. Thank you. Our next month's interview uh, will be me interviewing Civic Science CEO John Dick. Um, stay, you can stay in the loop with all these events, any opportunities, and uh, all the uh, startup firms on Build in Pittsburgh. If you're not, that's probably how you're here. Is that how most of you are here? Raise your hand. Awesome. That's awkward for the two of you that didn't raise your hand. Um, tomorrow night, as he said, he's going to have a launch for DataWorks at the University Club, right? University Club. Uh, it's on the calendar on Build in Pittsburgh. Uh, we have Startup Weekend coming up on April 5th to 7th, right across the street. We'll be doing some work here. It'll be awesome. If you're not signed up, fail. <laughs> um, National Day of Civic Hacking. Um, June 1st, the White House has an initiative to do civic hacking. So we'll hack around um, some uh, positive civic uh, problems that will solve the technology. I'll have, uh, I brought that to Pittsburgh for us in accordance with Fruit Built Pittsburgh. And then um, the next time you're here, this won't look nothing like uh, what you see right now. Um, there'll be a lot. Th this will be changed, uh, and uh, we'll have more information on that later. Uh, so the next, um, the next time when I'm interviewing John up here, uh, this room will be totally different and have a pur different purpose. But uh, more news on that later. And vowels are selfish. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, there's more beer and food in the back. Thank Marty's Market. Give it a round of applause.